Thanks for joining us today on this webinar. We continue our series today with a, what we think is another uh, excellent and appropriate uh, session, this time around uh, regional economics for meat. But before we jump into that, let me just say a bit about the Wallace Center at Windrock International, which has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a 21st century food system that is healthier for people, healthier for the environment, and healthier for the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we are focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, green, fair, and affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. And with that, let me turn it back over to Jeff. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give a little introduction to the National Good Food Network. Back in late 2008, we gathered thought leaders uh, in sustainable food systems looking to build on the great success that farmers markets and other direct sales had. We saw the opportunity to scale up that good work into the mainstream food system to supply schools, hospitals, restaurants, and supermarkets with healthy, fair, affordable, and green food, what we call good food. We have a particular emphasis on working with both rural and urban underserved communities. The Wallace Center, along with a high-powered team of advisors, created the National Good Food Network to create solutions to scaling up good food. These advisors come from many different sectors, including nonprofit, for-profit, and academia, and they continue to advise us on how the NGFN can most effectively affect food system change. We created a national network of networks. We have 10 regional networks, teams of several organizations within a region. This makes up the National Good Food Network. The Wallace Center, as a national coordinator of the networks, what we call regional lead teams, takes the best of the best models and brings them forward to enable replication. We also provide a suite of technical assistance that the regions are able to tap into. This helps us to fulfill three critical goals. We work with the growers and the buyers, connect them, and using this value chain approach, we're able to increase grower viability, particularly small and medium-sized growers. Making these connections and deals at, deals adds economic vitality to the rural production areas, as well as the urban inner city depressed regions, getting more healthy food where it is needed most. This allows us to reach children and families in their communities. We are a national connector. We make sure the right people talk to each other. We connect people to people. We create, collect, and disseminate the best of the best models, knowledge, and market-based technical assistance. For instance, we're now working on a project in cooperation with USDA Agricultural Marketing Service and a few other organizations studying the various food hubs across the country with the goal of creating a TA document and network. A bit more on this at the end of the webinar. We connect regions to funding both by ensuring they know about national funding opportunities, but also by working to generate new opportunities. One example of this is the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development, or HUFED Center, also housed at the Wallace Center. To learn more about the HUFED Center, you can visit hufed.org. That's H-U-F-E-D dot O-R-G. The NGFN maintains a website and a database of people, organizations, and funders to connect people within and across regions. This is another great networking tool. We work with companies interested in buying more regional good food. For instance, our work with the Cisco Corporation yielded more regional food into hospitals, inner city public schools, and other important outlets. We then document these models and allow others to learn and build upon our successes. We build community. We gather people from different sectors together to share ideas and find common business interests. We read all the email we get to contact at ngfn.org and take our responsibility to make the right connections very seriously. Let us know how we can help you work better, to, how we can help support you. And we connect with other national networks, such as the National Farm to School Network, the Community Food Security Coalition, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, School Food Focus, and others to coordinate efforts and create synergy, accelerating this work and reducing redundancy. Working with our advisory council, we established three goals for the NGFN. Make sure there is good supply of good food by working with growers and doing on-farm training. Act as an information hub using tools such as this web webinar, making sure those on the ground are connected to the best information that exists. And we're working to make sure that policymakers understand the economic, health, and social benefits to those work. This map shows that we truly are a national network spanning coast to coast. 
Here are the members of the NGFN Advisory Council, thought leaders in sustainable food systems work. I'm sure many of you will recognize these organizations. And our 10 regional lead teams, boots on the ground, well connected in tight groups, doing a huge amount of great work. All of this information is available at ngfn.org as well. You should feel free to contact us at any time. The NGFN is headed up by John Fisk and Marty Gerenser. John is the director of the Wall Center. Again, that's where the NGFN is housed, and Marty is the manager of the NGFN. Thank you, John, and uh, back to you. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Boy, you do such a nice job with that. You're really getting better at that every time we do this. So let's see. As, uh, as Jeff explained, the National Good Food Network is an initiative um, of the Wallace Center with that strong market-based change focus. These webinars in particular are designed to be a technical assistance platform that really offers you the expertise and the connection and knowledge that we see across the country. So with that, let me introduce you to today's presenters. I've got to say that I'm really proud to have with us today two staff members from the Center for Ag Development and Entrepreneurship in New York State. Chris Harmon, who's the Executive Director of CADE, as well as Nicole Day, who's the Director of Programming and Communications. Let me tell you a little bit about each of them before I turn it over to Chris to take it away. Chris originally hails from Indiana and has graduated from Ball State University in Muncie. He moved to New York in 1991 to work for the Nature Conservancy as the preserve manager of the Lower Hudson Chapter. He left the Nature Conservancy in 2002 to pursue his dream of farming. With his wife and two children, they purchased a 117-acre farm in Otsego County, which is central, south central New York, and began raising grass-fed beef, pastured poultry, and hogs. He, has sold, he sold at several farmers markets for six years. He now sells primarily to individuals, restaurants, and CSAs. Chris and his family now run a head of beef, a herd of beef, sorry, there needs to be an R in there, a herd of beef, and farm 300 acres. In 2007, Chris became the executive director of CADE, uh, and decided to scale back his family, his farming operation in order to spend more time with the family. I'm not sure, Chris, you, you've got much more time with the family because CADE has really taken off given the work you're doing. It's a nonprofit agricultural development organization serving farmers and businesses in New York State. Since its inception, CADE has worked to connect producers of value-added farm products to markets. The organization conducts research on ag opportunities and markets with the goal of building a thriving community-based food system. CADE is essentially acting as a nonprofit consulting firm in the area of sustainable agriculture, which I think is a powerful model. They provide strategic technical assistance to clients, which are farmers, distributors, slaughterhouses, creameries, and commercial kitchens in the areas of business development, financing, accounting, e-commerce, distribution, and marketing. Let me talk, tell you a little bit about Nicole. Nicole Day is originally from southern New Hampshire and graduated the University of New Hampshire with a BA in economics. In 1998, she started a natural foods manufacturing business, Mediterranean, Mediterranean Delights, based in southern Vermont. After 12 years in the food business, Nicole moved to the Catskills and began working for, the, for CADE, uh, which I told you about. Nicole is the Director of Programming and Communications now, which includes programming development while also working intimately with CADE's clients in various projects, including marketing plan analysis, business analysis, HACCP plan development, customer service plans, organic certification plan development, processing and manufacturing facility development. So as you can see, uh, these two folks have a long history and background both in business and in grass-based agriculture, and I think qualify them uh, extremely uh, a lot to talk to us today on this particular issue. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris, and away we go. Thanks, John. Um, welcome, everybody across the country. Uh, I want to thank the Wallace Center for allowing us this opportunity uh, to speak to you uh, about this uh, very important and and rather controversial issue. There is no real way to get into the issue of meat without uh, causing some problems or causing some conflict. Um, as John mentioned, uh, I am the executive director for CAID, the Center for Agricultural Development and Entrepreneurship. CADE was developed in 1991 as a result of the demise of the family farm. Um, the real goal for us was to put farmers in control of their destiny uh, by giving them access to markets and the development of value-added products. Um, and CADE has since then uh, 
our model has evolved and we are now, as John said, basically a nonprofit, sustain, a nonprofit consulting firm in the area of sustainable agriculture. We do have a small staff, um, and, uh, but a, a very dedicated board and a portfolio of consultants that do the yeoman's share of the work. Uh, our mission statement is to increase the number and diversity of successful farm enterprises and related businesses in New York. CADE is a true triple bottom line organization. Uh, we look at the economic bottom line, we look at the environmental bottom line, and we look at the social bottom line. And we hope that is evident within the presentation that we will be giving today. So uh, on uh, the, the advertisement for this webinar, there were many things that we were going to touch on, and we kind of wanted to, to get into those specifically. Uh, kind of give you an overall view of regional meat and a kind of drill down into some detail into um, uh, slaughterhouses in particular. I, I will make a, a couple notes. Um, I am all about transparency and so is Cade and we do refer to these as slaughterhouses. We do not like the term livestock processing units. We do not like the term harvest systems. Uh, in our minds, we are killing these animals and processing the carcasses into pieces of meat. So it is a bit of a touchy subject for some folks, but that's the reality. So uh, with that in mind, um, when we do say meat in this webinar, we primarily mean beef unless otherwise noted. Uh, we would like to talk about poultry, we would like to talk about hogs and lambs and such, but this is a, a rather broad subject. Um, so when we are talking about meat, we are talking about beef. So what do we mean by regional meat? Well, the Wallace Center defines good food, as Jeff and John has said, uh, as fair, healthy, green, and affordable. And when we talk about regional meat, we do mean good food, and that the meat is fair, where the animals were raised and slaughtered with fair labor, where the farmer was returned a fair value for the product, that the meat, that the food is healthy. The meat is actually good for you, high in omega-3s, low in omega-6s, high in CLAs, conjugated linoleic acid, where the animals were only given antibiotics in the case of acute injury. I was certified organic. Uh, I am not for many reasons now, primarily because we lack certified organic slaughterhouses. Um, at the same time, I am not so idealistic that I would not give an injured animal a shot of antibiotics. But we do not background our animals with antibiotics. We do not feed medicated feed on my farm. And I think that for regional meat, that is an important component. We also feel that the only hormones that should be in these animals are naturally occurring hormones. We, we do not feel that good food has hormone implants. We feel that this regional meat is, is green. Animals are raised on pastures and forages. Uh, and if any grain is given, I am not a 100% grass-fed producer. I do finish my animals, but I do it in moderation, starting with a few pounds a day and then finishing with about 10 or 12 while they have complete access to hay and or pasture. And yes, we do mean that regional meat is affordable by being appropriately priced and transparent in its true cost. And we'll get into that a little bit further. And where no tax payer dollars have gone into subsidies, uh, I do not receive any subsidies on my farm. It would be nice to get some subsidies, but uh, I do not get any. Uh, except I would have to say that, that my road system, my distribution, to be able to get into markets, uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, tax dollars that go into the roads that we travel on, and I, I should be uh, conscious of that. Um, but also where rural communities are strengthened by a local agricultural economy. Cade believes that agriculture is the backbone of rural economies, certainly once was and certainly should be again. So good meat comes from animals that have a good life and, and one bad day. And as it says, we all have that bad day. So what we mean by industrial meat, and there is a difference here. Uh, we will be talking about regional meat, but I will talk about industrial meat. Industrial meat to us is bad food, the opposite of good food. The food is unhealthy for you. It is environmentally damaging. 
it does utilize unfair labor practices and squeezes the producers in the supply chains. And it is unaffordable because it has numerous hidden costs that are not within the cost of the food at the cash register. It is cheap, but it is ultimately very, very expensive. Industrial meat comes from animals not raised on grass and pasture except uh, when they were born and possibly during backgrounding. These are animals finished in really large feedlots. Animals that as calves were basically given a growth hormone implant to, in a sense, add about five cents to the pound uh, in auction houses. Animals that are fed 30 to 50 pounds of, gr of grain a day rather than grass and forages. These are ruminants. These are animals that have a phenomenal, incredible ability to turn inedible grass into edible meats and edible milk and ultimately we manufacture those down into other products. Um, and industrial meat comes from animals that are fed antibiotics regularly as part of their daily feed. The largest amount of antibiotics in this country, and I think in this world, are fed to animals, about three quarters of all the antibiotics that are produced. And industrial meat comes from animals that are slaughtered in a facility that handles thousands of animals per day. The livestock slaughterhouses that we will talk about today really cover, uh, really, uh, their capacity is two, three, maybe 5,000, 10,000 or so a year. Um, animals slaughtered in a large, huge facility uh, with industrial meat does not allow custom cutting. I cannot send an individual animal in and have it cut in the specifications for farmers markets or for my customers. And animals that are slaughtered in a facility by butchers who don't have the skill set to break down a whole carcass, but are only part of a disassembly line. They're, in our opinion, not a skill building facility, not something that you could take technical skills off to and develop your own business. And I think the quote speaks for itself. So what are one of the major roadblocks to regional meat? Well, it's really the unbalanced price of food. Uh, I think all of us know this, that our food system is petroleum-based. It's, it's uh, basically since World War II, we came out of that war with technology to build munitions, to build bombs, and that was turned into being able to make fertilizer. And we applied that to our fields. And through the Green Revolution, through the discovery of antibiotics and being fed to animals and the petroleum-based system, we had the, the perfect storm, if you will, to create a, a unbalanced food system, a petroleum-based system. Um, because of this petroleum, this fossil fuel-based food system, we have grown accustomed to paying a cheap market price for food through subsidized commodities of billions of dollars that are fed into this system where it is still uh, a bushel of corn still costs less than it does to produce, although it is it has gone up. As I saw recently out of Cornell, it's gone to $7 a bushel. And that the, the unbalanced price of food creates confined animal feed operations, CAFOs, and ultimately what we would call inexpensive cattle and inexpensive meat products, and where processors can kill, as I've said, thousands upon thousands of animals a day. But of course, just because it is an inexpensive or cheap doesn't mean we don't pay for it in other ways. As I've mentioned, uh, is in billions of dollars in subsidies, we also pay billions of dollars later on down the road in health care costs. We are an obese nation. There is a tremendous rise in type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and food-caused cancers. We have a national foreign policy that is resulting in foreign conflicts. Um, and we have displaced farmers here in the United States and throughout the world. The idea of get big or get out meant that you were taking over your neighbor's farm, basically. Uh, free trade agreements where we have dumped inexpensive corn into other countries has displaced uh, native farmers and sent them over our borders. Those displaced farmers are the uh, people of color on the, on the streets looking for jobs. Certainly in uh, parts of New York, we see these all over the places. Uh, other hidden costs are greenhouse gas emissions. Industrial agriculture is the largest source of greenhouse gases. 
contamination of water bodies. We have dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, Chesapeake Bay, and all this is through the runoff of agricultural and agricultural waste from animal waste, the loss of topsoil, our, our, true, our true value, our true bank, if you will, and we are losing it at massive amounts, and certainly fertilizers and pesticides. And the use of our world's fresh water, I urge anybody to look at the Blue Water Initiative, and uh, I urge anybody to look at uh, the potential of damage of natural gas drilling and hydrofracking in upstate New York and in the Marcellus Shale. It is a, a big problem. And also the loss of the world's agricultural diversity. Through thousands upon thousands of years, the humans created plants and, and, and animals uh, that were uh, unique to their geography, unique to their climate. Uh, you may have seen behind me Belt of Galloways. I run Belt of Galloways. I do not run Angus. I do not run Hereford. I think Angus and Hereford are fantastic animals. But I also think that Belt of Galloways and others are, and they deserve a place uh, in our food system as well. So I, I was asked to give a brief picture of the industrial meat business, and I am not in the industrial meat business, so this is, this is really me looking at uh, various uh, articles, listening to many, many people that are far more eloquent and intelligent than I am to discuss this issue. Um, but basically in the, US meat in the U.S., industrial meat has been reduced to very specialized sectors. Uh, calves are born on cow -cop calf operations throughout the country. In the state of Kentucky, the bluegrass state that, you know, grows grass incredibly well, it is a cow-calf state. Uh, uh, there is not a lot of operators amongst the 84, 87,000 farms who are finishing beef in that state, and it's, it's uh, a, a tremendously missed opportunity. Um, calves are, of course, implanted with a growth hormone device. Uh, this uh, allows them to grow more, even though we do have research that shows that young girls are reaching sexual maturity much quicker and young boys are reaching sexual maturity much later. As a father of two children, this concerns me a great deal, and luckily because I have a livestock farm and the resources, my children don't eat this kind of meat. Um, and they drink organic valley milk because I don't want hormones in their milk. Uh, the industrial meat business, you know, once, once the, cows, the calves are born and they're typically on those farms raised up to about 600 or 700 pounds, they're then sold into a feedlot or before that they're sold into a backgrounding operation that brings them to this weight. These are shipped to a feedlot where then they are fed grain that is of course supplemented with antibiotics until they reach a market weight, about 1,000 to 1,400 pounds. And then they are sent to a slaughterhouse and, and killed and then further processed. This is an interesting diagram of this. Uh, this came out of a feasibility study uh, done in northern Michigan, and we quote the source there, and we'll also quote a lot of the sources of much of our information at the end of this presentation. Um, for us, I think also for many other folks, it's all about uh, reducing the vertical integration of our food system, of trying to put the consumer more in contact with the producer. Certainly as a producer I need inputs into my farm. I certainly then need to have a, uh, a, a cattle hauler or I haul them in my own trailer to a slaughterhouse and then either I, my customers are picking it up or I'm distributing it or I'm having the distributor pick it up and freight it. Sometimes to retail outlets but in most cases it's going directly to the consumer. In this, you see the various areas where the beef is marketed and, and through the channels that it, that it travels. So what are the roadblocks to good regional meat? Well, it's expensive to finance a beef operation. And there are not, <laughs> there are not many entities or financing agencies that will give you money to purchase livestock. Access to land is a huge problem. Uh, in upstate New York, uh, there are over 3 million acres of fallow land in this state, yet access can still be a problem. Yet meanwhile, there is a huge unmet demand of local and regional meats in New York City and Boston that is not being met. 
we have long winters here in the Northeast. I have friends who live in Oklahoma where I was born, and you know, aside from these bizarre winters that have happened in the past year and this year, uh, you know, normally they're only looking to, to feed some cattle for two or three weeks in the emergency. Uh, we tend to look at about 160 to 200 days of winter. A lot of work is going in to reduce that down to about 120 days. Uh, but for me as a farmer, I look from about uh, the end of November till mid-May, and I look at about 200 days of winter when I'm trying to figure out my forages. Uh, a lot of people think that you can buy meat anytime throughout the year, and this is absolutely true. It is not like fruits and vegetables. But there is a seasonality of production, particularly in the north and in the northeast. We as farmers do not like to feed our animals through the wintertime. It cuts into our profit margins. There is some work going on with folks who are trying to fall calf and so that they only feed through one winter and they're looking to butcher at 18 to 22 months. One of the problems, of course, is this is, you know, primarily grass-fed animals grow slower. Uh, and this is, of course, a huge issue for us in slaughterhouses where if an animal is older than 24 months, I cannot allow the bone to be in the spinal column. That means that all my T-bones, all my porterhouses are boned out and I'm selling strip steaks and filet mignon or tenderloin. Uh, that means that all of my rib steaks are ribeyes. Uh, they're all Delmonico, which means without bone. Um, and this is due to the threat of BSE, of mad cow disease, right? Because it's been shown to concentrate within the spinal column, within the nervous tissue, and it's never been shown within animals under 24 months. Regardless of 100% grass-fed animals or people who would like to, to test those animals. So it's a, it's a big, big issue. And a lack of liquid markets. Really, uh, you know, there are great opportunities for people in the Northeast to be able to graze animals through 180 days and then sell them. Uh, you could put 1.6 to 2 pounds of meat on an animal and put 300 to 350 pounds on a 500-pound calf. Um, but then where do we sell them in those numbers? And ultimately, you have to go back to conventional auctions to move those types of numbers. Our customers are not knowledgeable about cattle production and beef products in general. Most want the middle meats. Most want T-bones, porterhouses, sirloin, uh, rib steaks. Uh, trying to get rid of roasts, trying to get rid of ground beef has become a huge problem. And to be quite honest, people who grow up eating basically beef paste or burgers that don't really taste like a hamburger are not that interested in real ground beef. For hogs and chickens, uh, and I, I ran, I still have about 30 hogs. Uh, I will raise a few chickens, but I don't like raising chickens. But they require much more of a grain-based diet. And grain producers and feed mills are needed. This is one of the reasons why I dropped my organic certification. Because all of the organic corn and soy back in the early 2000s was coming out of Brazil and China. Meanwhile, all of my local neighbors were planting corn, which is primarily GM corn, Roundup Ready corn, that was going into the local mill and being uh, processed. Uh, the only people who could afford my organic meat, which I could not call certified organic because it was not processed or killed in an organic slaughterhouse, were affluent, wealthy people. I could not feed my neighbors, my community, with that meat. And so I opted out of the certified organic uh, status. I still do everything certified organically, but I will, I will administer antibiotics, although I've only done that once in eight years of farming. Poultry slaughter facilities are definitely a roadblock in the Northeast because we do not have a lot of people producing poultry in mass numbers. I will say that for any poultry slaughterhouse, you need to be moving 100 to 150 animals through on an hourly basis to be able to develop a profit and to make it worth your while. And as I've said, certified organic slaughterhouses are seriously lacking in the Northeast and is a huge roadblock. Uh, one of the things that Jeff had included is in the announcement is our economics of meat very different from produce. Uh, yeah, uh, it's tremendously different. Fruits and vegetables economics are much more difficult to get your head around. Uh, you need to look at uh, the economics of each variety of fruit or vegetable and the numerous variables, as you can see listed here, that affect each variety in just the production. For us here at K, dealing with dairy, dealing with meat is, is easy. 
compared to dealing with fruits and vegetables. As we start to work with growers in the Mohawk Valley or certified organic growers in Delaware County, uh, it is difficult to get our head around the complexity of fruits and vegetables. The cost of beef differs from pork like the cost of green beans differs from tomatoes. So um, it, it is just a, it's a very different animal to say the least. Uh, the infrastructure for each species also varies for meat production. Uh, obviously, uh, cow, animals have to be killed and processed. Uh, produce does not, uh, really. I mean, typically you're talking about cleaning it and sorting it and selling it. But obviously, if you're turning in seconds or uh, other products into value-added product, value products, then you do have to look at uh, further processing. Uh, to reach levels of economic sustainability, uh, animals require a lot more land than produce does. Uh, but uh, one of the benefits of living in upstate New York is you can buy good hilltop land still for fairly cheap, although of course gas drilling is, is coming in and making a, uh, that a little bit more difficult. Um, we, we own our mineral rights east of the Mississippi. West of the Mississippi, they don't. And so it's a, it's a very different thing for us out here. Killing frosts are not really an issue for any of my animals, uh, except when I've ever grown Cornish rocks, and I, I try to stay away from them. But it's a huge issue. Uh, as most produce guys in the farmer's market like to say, it's the, it's the F word. Uh, we hear the F word is coming uh, here in uh, October or November. Um, and certainly, uh, animals, uh, you have potential for more liability. Your animals get out. Uh, there is a strong potential for liability. And with many uh, fruits and vegetable producers, genetic drift of GMOs is becoming a, a major issue, uh, especially with the allowance of Roundup Ready or genetically modified alfalfa that has been allowed into our, our, our environment. Uh, obviously, both forms of production, once you reach a certain scale, require more steel in the field. Uh, you know, you're talking tractors and forage making equipment, but you're talking, you know, um, uh, uh, potato hillers, uh, potato harvesters, you know, green bean harvesters, uh, vibration tables, all sorts of different things to process them. Um, but even um, even if you're doing um, if you're buying in your winter forages as a farmer and you're not making your own forages, if you're doing round bales, you still require a tractor. And if you're doing square bales, then you require a lot of labor. And I've learned that at a, at a very early stage in my farming career. So where should we concentrate our efforts to most effectively pave the way? Well, obviously, if you're going to look at a slaughterhouse, you need to conduct a feasibility study. Uh, you should not just think that because you can't get into a slaughterhouse that you need another slaughterhouse. There is a need for education of the farmers and the slaughterhouses that they are both necessary to each other. Um, the slaughterhouses need the farmers. The farmers need the slaughterhouses. Uh, we do need to educate the consumers as to why our meat is more expensive than it is in the grocery stores. And I think I touched on that a little bit earlier. And I think that we do need to train the trainers uh, extension and land grant institutions. As I alluded to, there is a huge unmet demand out of New York City and Boston here in the Northeast. And meanwhile, there are three million acres of fallow land in New York State. Uh, and I think educating the educators, and I see that this is smaller, so I blame Jeff for that. But um, this food movement is not a fad. This is an agricultural trend. And I am starting to see that out of Cornell, that they are acknowledging that, and out of Penn State, that and you see industrial pushback uh, in the marketplace that, you know, people saying local, uh, Frito-Lay says local, you know, on certain uh, uh, products, or at least they did. And uh, I've actually never seen that. I've only heard about that in a, in a presentation. Um, educating the service providers, such as Cade, uh, through, you know, there are many people who work in food systems in rural areas, and there are many people who work in urban areas. And I touched on this at the NISOG conference. And aside from the Northeast Sustainable Ag Working Group conference, where they brought urban and rural folks together, um, there's not a lot of cross-pollination of our groups, and, and we do need to come together to do that. And certainly, the development of food value chains, and you could do three or four webinars on food value chains, and, and still, uh, it, it's a very complex subject. But really what you're talking about is a supply chain that does not uh, compete against 
the comp each other within the components that values one another, that has collaboration, that has prices that are not too high and not too low, that work together for uh, the final end. And lastly, you know, one of the big issues, and I'll touch on this more, is farmers need to learn their true cost of production. And this is huge. Uh, we did a lot of checking into this in, uh, throughout the country, and we found most farmers have no idea of their production costs. And there are numerous variables, and I won't go into all these. And one of the things is we put a lot of this information on here so that people could go back and review this. But the cost of production vary across the country, and then they vary across the various states within the, uh, the areas of the country, and then across regions, and then from farm to farm, depending upon all those variables. Cow-calf operations are typically selling their animals in live auctions. And from our studies, you know, you're lucky if you're making 45 to 100 bucks. Um, to be viable, you have to determine through good record keeping over several years your total cost of production. This is an example of a, of a great uh, publication called the Comparing the Structure, Size, and Performance of Local and Mainstream Food Supply Chains. Uh, the uh, link will be at the end uh, of this uh, webinar and online. But you can see that um, basically if you're, if you're looking at direct markets, uh, as compared to selling into what you would call sort of the supply chain, there, there's, a, there's a great big difference, and, uh, and you can refer to this later. This, is, um, this next slide is, is a little bit more detailed. This is one of my animals, uh, a belted Galloway steer at, hung at 708 pounds with a hot carcass weight. I have broken all this out into the exact weight that came out, the exact weight, and I weighed all this when it was being heart carted out and I was putting it in, in the coolers. Um, typically when you're looking at yields, you really don't include your organ meats and your soup bones. Um, but you can see here the prices are prices that I had in farmers markets back when I was selling. And some of these obviously have changed now. Many of them have gone up. I know several farmers who sell ground beef at $5 a pound instead of, uh, at $7 a pound, sorry, instead of $5 a pound. But if I sold all of these products, uh, I would basically take home $2,904, and you can come back and refer to this. And then you can get into all of this. These are all my various costs. I paid $60 for the kill and $0.79 cents a pound for private backing. So it ultimately worked out to be about $619. Now, if I had put that into butcher paper, it would have been only $442, but most customers want to see their meat. Um, it costs about $40 to haul an animal to the slaughterhouse, and I'm about 25 miles from the slaughterhouse. Uh, these are farmer's market prices, but this quote sort of breaks it down as to my time uh, and the cost there. Uh, at $15 an hour, which I know is not a lot, but that's what I pay people to sell at farmer's markets for me. So you can get into here the total cost of hauling, the total cost for selling, processing, and marketing. And for me, the cost for producing a steer over two years is $900. Now, I will comment on this. This is only after the calves that were born on my farm grew up to be cows and had babies. So this steer was one of those babies from a baby and it's still $900 to produce a steer. And all of this meat in a beefer took me about two weeks at three farmer's markets to sell. Now, I do want to point out, I, I made about uh, $700. Now, I don't like to sell in farmer's markets because it's, it's, a, it's, a high, it's a high risk and there's potential for high return, but there's a potential for no return, um, particularly if downstate uh, Consumers don't come up to my upstate markets. So now I sell mainly by the side. Uh, I haul that same animal into Steiner's, uh, and I sell it for about 250 a pound hanging weight. Um, my production costs and hauling are the same. Uh, the customer pays for the processing, whether it's cryoback or paper, and then the necessary freighting if it's going downstate. Most of the time they're going and picking it up, so that $100 is, it depends on where you're at. Um, and then I charge seventeen seventy. I end up making, if you go down to the bottom, eight hundred and thirty dollars, a hundred dollars more than all the work that I did in the farmers markets. And this is not a knock against people who sell in farmers markets. It's just simply pointing out that 
selling sides and quarters is more profitable if you have that market. And Mike Lorenz and Aaron Thubumery of Lorenz Meats, who you will hear about uh, in another webinar coming up in the, in the future, have a great publication about this. And it's, uh, the link is at the end of this uh, presentation. So let's look at it from the customer point of view. If they bought all of that meat at the farmer's market, they're almost paying $3,000. Um, and I do include the soup bones and the organ meats because I could sell those in the farmer's market. So you're looking at about $6.62 uh, sorry, $6.62 a pound. Uh, but if they buy it uh, from the whole, whole carcass, they're paying almost a dollar less. Okay, And if they put it in the butcher paper, they're paying a dollar thirty-five less. There is a way to get to affordable meats, and personally, it, it, it is scale, and it is selling sides and whole animals. Um, but for me to make a decent living, I, I, and I personally think where I live, 40000 a year is a decent living, I need to sell 48 beefers, okay? But for me to make a decent living in farmer's markets, I need to sell 54 beefers. And up here, most farmer's markets, although we're doing a lot better with winter markets, have about a 26-week season. Okay, and I could only sell 13 beefers in those three markets, so I would need to have 12 markets to do that. Um, do we need more slaughterhouses? Well, that all depends. Uh, it is seasonal, particularly here in the Northeast, and certainly as farmers, when we can't get our animals butchered, yes, we think that we do. But many slaughterhouse owners feel we don't, because it's really a question of spreading this butchering and slaughtering out throughout the year. We like to look at plants operating at about 60 to 80 percent capacity, but some plants, and we've heard from several, uh, are, are operating at less than 30, some 15 to 20 percent. In these areas, they have a lot of competition from non-USDA slaughterhouses where products are being butchered and uh, animals are being butchered and processed and then sold illegally as uh, as USDA type products and, and that should, just should not be allowed. Um, but there is a need to do a lot of uh, feasibility studies if you're looking at a slaughterhouse. In New York State, that three million acres that I mentioned, if we just put 10% of that back into production at two acres for producing one animal, you're talking an additional 150,000 cattle. And we want to capture the butchering and the processing of those animals here for job creation and economic development and economic multipliers. So we would still need another 30 slaughterhouses for what we consider a large facility at 5,000 a head. What are some of the factors? And there are lots of them, and I will try and touch on these, but please conduct a feasibility study. It is imperative. Have a good business plan and a solid pro forma so you can, you can really see if you're going to make any money. Don't be intimidated by HACCP. It is the rules of the game, but USDA will work with you. We have found this out. Uh, I will say that Chris Raines out of Penn State has been incredibly helpful for us in developing HACCP plans for our customers. Site selection is key. One of our clients was looking at $76,000 for a septic system, and uh, because he decided it on a different site, it was $26,000. Um, most successful slaughterhouses are family-run businesses. Many that are started up by a group of farmers fail because they don't necessarily know what they're getting into. Uh, there has been a serious lack of training for butchers. Uh, the, the State University of New York at Cobble Skill with Eric Shelley has developed a, a, ni a nice program to get people oriented around that with 40 hours a week for four weeks. Aside from before that, the only place you could go was Toledo. But I think that there are other places out there. But most butchers, most slaughterhouses would, pre would prefer to train their own and then keep them for many years. Efficiency is all related to product flow. You know, your layout has to be, be set up so that nothing ever goes backwards. It all has to flow forwards. And the height, I can't stress this enough. You need good height. If you have to quarter carcasses, if you can't hang a whole side of beef, then you are cutting your, your, your facility in half for its capacity and you are losing yield. That quarter carcass will start to rot and need to have pieces of that cut off and, and you have to cut that half when it's cold. If it's hot, then it's not a clean cut and you can have tremendous waste. Basically, the size of your hot box and your coolers, the hot box being, of course, when the hot carcasses are chilled down, is very important. And these are really based off of how many workers you can have comfortably and efficiently on your kill floor. 
every other area, the holding pins, the kill floor, the processing room, even the freezer, is based off of your the number of, an, the number of workers on your kill floor and the size of your hot box and your coolers. You need well-designed holding pins to ensure safety for your workers and the animals. Your rails must be three feet apart or four, in, four feet off, and four feet off the walls. Now, this can be thinner if you're doing hogs. I think that's like 28 inches or so, but don't quote me. You'd have to look at the regs. But you are limited then to those rails only being used for hogs or sheep or, or goats. You can't hang beefers on those unless you're, you're skipping a rail. Having a scalder will make you more efficient. You know, a two, two workers, as it says here, can do 20 hogs in four hours, while two workers skinning hogs can only do about 15. Plus, you have a heavier hanging weight as a slaughterhouse. You make more money. And the feet, the ears, the snout, and the tail are still available for sale. But, and there's less waste, but you're talking about a $27,000 price tag. A hide puller will speed up the kill floor, it'll keep the carcass cleaner, and will return a higher value. You want sanitizers within quick reach. You don't want your, your guys on your kill floor wandering around to sanitize their knife. Typically one on each wall, but it depends upon, again, the design of your kill floor. Customer service, and I will not stress this enough, is key. Farmers are gossipy. And if we get a bad situation at a slaughterhouse, we will tell everybody else. And you must have good cutting skills. You, you know, if I get sirloins or I get T-bones or something that taper from one inch to three quarter, they will hear about it. And to get consistent customers year-round, you have to have good customer service. And all of us, everybody makes mistakes, especially experienced butchers. You need to know how to rectify that. It's, it's how do you deal with that. And you need to be honest, and you need, obviously, a separate office for your USDA inspector. You need to dry goods storage and a break room. And lastly, beware of used equipment. The USDA has stressed this to us. People put a lot of USDA equip a lot of equipment out there that they cannot get listeria out of. When it's cold, it does not test. When you fire it up and it warms up, listeria tests do show up positive. So uh, this is just basically giving you an idea. I'm not going to go through all this, but there are variable kill charges and cut, wrap, and freeze charges at slaughterhouses throughout the New York State. And this kind of gives you an idea. Aside from one facility that seems a little off, ultimately they seem to balance themselves out, whether you're doing a $50, $50 kill or a $90 kill, whether you're doing $0.85 cents or $0.80. Cents. Some places in the Midwest don't even charge a kill fee. Um, some uh, you know, only charge a processing fee. HACCP. Um, on this note, I'm going to have Nicole just really briefly touch base, but now she's saying no, uh, that I should just stick with my flow. I am not a, a major HACCP guy, um, but uh, Nicole does all of our HACCP work for our clients, and I do see that I'm starting to run out of work a little bit. I ran out of time, so I'm going to try and hurry up. These are really interesting quotes from, from Chris, Chris Raines, and they basically speak for themselves. Um, you know, the principles of HACCP are the same for any operator. Uh, one of the things that I would say that we have learned is that boilerplate HACCP uh, plans, um, if you're just sticking your name on a boilerplate HACCP plan or somebody else's, that's a recipe for disaster. If you're having a consultant come in and do your HACCP plan and you did not work with them, you were not part of the HACCP planning process, that's another recipe for disaster. You should have one and a half people at least dedicated to HACCP. So if that person is sick, then they, another person can step in. This is some information about HACCP. Uh, in our next webinar on questions, we can get more into the details. We strongly urge you to talk to a Meat Science University about this um, and uh, uh, to, to develop this. But again, you need to work with your HACCP plan. Every year, slaughterhouses have to adjust their HACCP plan. These are various links that you can go to to uh, look at HACCP, um, and uh, that's, that's very self-explanatory. I, I would be uh, remiss if I was not getting into what people call mobile processing units. Um, and I have mixed feelings about mobile units. And to be quite honest, these are not mobile processing units. These are mobile slaughter units. These are mobile kill floors. Every MPU or MSU that we have looked at, including uh, the IGFC out on, uh, I think that's Lopez Island on uh, San Juan County, 
and the Lila MPU out of Glenwood Center, the local infrastructure, local agriculture uh, piece of equipment, is actually a, a mobile slaughter unit. After the animals are killed, gutted, and skinned, they are typically almost always shipped to a USDA processing facility um, where they do not have a kill floor. Um, all MPUs or MSUs require bricks and mortar of a USDA processor. You've got to age these carcasses. Um, in some cases, they could be cut into primals and cryovac, um, uh, but uh, we're, not, we're not seeing that too much. Um, we, ju we just don't see that that much. Um, there are many uh, positives of mobile slaughter units and, so, and some negatives. Um, in some places, like as I understand it, Lopez Island or the Hudson Valley, you know, you're never going to have a slaughterhouse really developed on there. Either you don't have enough animals or it, nobody wants it in their backyard. Um, for areas where there are many 20C licenses, and, and I'm not sure if everybody in the country call these 20Cs, but in New York State, a 20C license is basically what a restaurant or a grocery store has uh, that uh, allows them to cut a USDA stamped carcass into more uh, into products, to, to break that down, to process it. And in many cases, these 20C places have uh, places to hang uh, these carcasses and such. Uh, um, so in those cases, they work very well. One of the big drawbacks, and we'll talk on this, is the height. And I talk, touched on the issues of height earlier. MSUs work very well with small animals like hogs, lambs, sheep, goats, and, and smaller cattle. But we've learned from Eklund's processing in Stanford, where the Lila facility was, they can't take an animal through there that will ultimately hang more than 950 pounds. Big bulls, big dairy coal cows, um, and really, uh, you're you're really looking. You're limited even further down to around 800 or 700. But you know, they do the ones that hang 950. But it is it is arduous. Uh, obviously, the negatives I've kind of talked a little bit about, but the throughput. The real issue for all slaughterhouses is how many animals can you put through. And, and I have not really gotten into this, but I will. The cost of developing slaughterhouses typically brand spanking new from the ground up, all the bells and whistles, buying the equipment, coolers, all of that is about $200, $250 to $300 a square foot. So a, a 5,000 square foot facility can run anywhere from a million on up to 1.5 million. The real question is, is can you put enough animals through to cover all of your costs and to pay you know, your labor, your, all your overhead costs, all your variable costs, and your mortgage? And when do you ever become cash positive? They are actually fairly expensive mobile slaughter units. Um, not only are you purchasing at least the MSU, and I'm not quite sure about Lopez, but with, uh, you know, with the Lila system, you're also talking about an awful truck. You're talking about a refrigerated truck, and you're talking about a trailer for the office and the break room. And depending upon the model, uh, they require a, a docking station. They require a concrete or asphalt pad, they, as well as electric and water and tanks, and, and it can become a little bit arduous. And they're not necessarily mobile. I mean, you can definitely unhook them and send them down the road, but these are not typically aside from the Lopez uh, Island one, going from farm to farm where the animal is just walked into the slaughter facility and uh, the offal is composted. Um, I could talk about composting, but I know I'm not going to have time. This is, uh, this is just getting into a bit of a pro forma, and I know we won't have a lot of time to go into, but this is, if you're going to develop a slaughterhouse, you have to get into a, a pro forma and the overall costs of everything. And this is, this is sort of a monthly income statement of what you're going to be looking at um, as far as your, what you're going to be making and the, and the balance sheets. And then you can get into this about your overhead costs. And what you can see here is that your, your, your payroll, uh, your, your total variable costs, they will vary uh, based upon your efficiencies. What you can see is if you're doing uh, you know, uh, almost a head an hour with uh, two, three, or four operators, you're looking at you know, $59 in total payroll, and you're looking at variable costs of 2010. But if your efficiency drops down, if you've got guys on the kill floor wandering around looking to sanitize, then you're almost at $75. 
if you're looking, the, the same thing goes here, and, and these are various uh, parts of the pro forma and trying to figure out your actual numbers. And this is, this is key for any business, whether you're making widgets or iPods or, or cutting up beefers and, and hogs. Um, again, your efficiency uh, is key. The number of operators uh, and can lower your overall costs. But then the moment you drop down to three quarters of a head an hour, that starts to go up. So, uh, and obviously having people who know what they are doing on the, uh, on the kill floor and in the processing room is absolutely key to your success. I know that I'm running out of time here, so I'll be quick. These are the various resources and links that will be on the website that you can access. Uh, we urge people to, to do their research and to access some of these places. Um, I, I'm sorry. And we want to give a thank you to many people out there who we spoke with. Certainly the Wallace Center, uh, certainly working with Jeff was fantastic. Larry Altheiser is one of our clients, and he was a custom exempt plant, and we've done a lot of work with him. He's set to open a new facility here in the next month. And Larry is one of those people who gives me a lot of tips and helped me with a, with a tremendous amount of knowledge in the livestock slaughtering business. Chris Rains was very helpful, Amy Sipes was very helpful, and certainly Kathy Harris of Nelps. And as I mentioned earlier, Arian Thabumri uh, of Lawrence Meats uh, spent a lot of time on the phone with me. I think one person here that may not be mentioned, and he's not because uh, I'll go back, is Bob Perry out of the U University of Kentucky. Bob talked to me on the phone for a good few hours. Uh, and, and really helped me with a lot of this. So with that, and I'm a little out of breath, I'm at the end of my presentation. I hope there are several questions. I don't know if there are, but we will take whatever questions we can in the limited time left. Thanks, Chris. That was a lot of information, and, uh, but I think the flow is very digestible. So there are, there are a number of questions, and I'm going um, gonna to sort through them, and we'll get to as many as we can. So the first question comes from um, Michelle Stubbings. Um, general, generally, the issue of, of breeds, heritage versus modern breeds, and how they fit into the different systems. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. It all depends upon the animal. Um, some systems, particularly, uh, well, it, it does kind of depend upon the animal. I mean, if you're talking Dexter cattle or you're talking miniatures, um, I, I don't think that that's any different than slaughtering veal. Um, I, 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 re I don't know if it really matters. I guess when I think of where it matters, I think of poultry processing. Um, I think of I think of egg layers. When I'm when I'm gutting a bird with a you know the, it's like a big barred rock or a, a Cornish rock, I can fit my hand into its belly without ripping my hand up on the pin bones. A lot of heritage breed birds, uh, slaughterhouses, poultry slaughterhouses, will charge you more because the guys in the in the gutting room are tearing their hands up on those pin bones. Um, I think that heritage breeds uh, will have less yield. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, your, your overall percentages of yield will vary. Um, I think that certainly I take a lot of grief from my belted Galloways from other guys who raise other animals and other slaughterhouses who don't think that my belties are, are up to the standard that they like, but tough. I'm the customer and that's what I'm paying for. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I would say that with red meat facilities, now, heritage breeds as compared to other breeds, I don't think that would be a, a relevant issue for most of those places. I, I would say that uh, some slaughterhouses will charge you more for sows, uh, for big animals, for big hogs. Uh, certainly, uh, and I think I alluded to this on the page about the, the cost of processing, uh, sheep that get over a certain weight will be charged more than lambs. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. No, I think that does answer the question. It gives a, gives a response to it from a number of different points of view, so I think that's useful. Uh, here's a question that comes in from Jim that maybe uh, you, Chris, or Nicole have a response for as well. Um, they're asking about whether you're actually working with slaughter facilities to help them provide enhanced service for small producers. And I think it raises a larger question that says, you know, yes, there are existing slaughterhouses out there. Would they benefit from some interaction from an organization like yours, would they be open to it, one, and would they benefit from it? 
Uh, the answer to that is yes. We are working with two brand new slaughterhouses. Um, one of mm -hmm. those is a brand spanking new uh, facility um, from folks who've never done slaughtering before, and one, as I mentioned, was Larry Altizer, who ran a custom exempt facility for 10 years and has 30 years of experience. We are working with a USDA processor, Purdy & Sons, in Shenango County, uh, in Sherburn, on their product flow, on their HACCP plans, um, and their overall design, as well as helping them sell local products into institutions universities and hospitals and such. We have approached some of the older slaughterhouses, um, particularly ones that we feel the, the operator is, is thinking about selling it, and we want to make sure that it remains as a resource. I would say that some of these folks, like farmers, are set in their ways and aren't always <laughs> open to uh, our advice. We can lead them to water. Uh, you can't make them take our advice. Um, so yes, we do work extensively with new and existing slaughterhouses, and we would certainly be more than willing to work with additional slaughterhouses, not just in New York State, but throughout the Northeast. Nicole, did you want to add anything, or did that pretty much cover it? No, it pretty much covers it, although, uh, you know, we definitely provide technical assistance to Kate's clients, which incorporates pretty much everything that Chris offered throughout the entire webinar. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, there's uh, so someone, um, Liz writes in, and you touched on this a little bit, Chris, about the difference between meat processing um, in the east and in the west of the Mississippi. Uh, kind of a compelling uh, point that you made, I think. So is there more about that, more about the differences, more things people should be aware of? Because we've got people on the line from across the states. Well, um, I don't know if I touched on the differences of meat processing between West and East as much as I touched on the issues of, of property ownership uh, a little right, bit with the But I would say that um, many of the folks that I've spoken to at you know uh, various conferences, Kellogg conferences and such, uh, folks that I know in Oklahoma, uh, folks that I know out in Iowa and Minnesota are utilizing the same types of slaughterhouses that we are. I would certainly say that out west you're, you're dealing with uh, a much broader geographic area and so your, your traveling, your hauling will change dramatically um, on some of those levels. I, I don't know if the actual slaughtering processing will be that different. Um, I will say this, what we found is that in some places um, west of the Mississippi, they're, they're lucky if they get a farmer to, uh, to reserve a slot 30 days to 60 days in advance. Um, many farmers just want to be able to get in without making reservations well in advance, and if they're, or they, they don't go in for their reservations, which is a huge blow to these slaughterhouses. Meanwhile, here in the Northeast, if you're not setting up your reservation six months to a year out, you will not get in. They're, they are filled up very rapidly. And then a lot of people don't understand why they don't open up come the fall. Um, so, you know, and the point is, is that these slaughterhouses have to be loyal to their farmers who come back year after year, and they're not just going to give up these spaces of these loyal, loyal farmers for somebody else who's just coming in out of the blue. You have to set this up well in advance, and that's, from what I understand, very different west of the Mississippi. Thank you. Uh, a lot of good questions here, and I'm, I'm struggling to read through all of them and pick out some good ones um, or make a distinction. So here's one. Um, you mentioned getting a really good feasibility study before a group of growers or somebody jumps into a, a processing facility. So the question is, how would you suggest that a group of growers begin looking into getting a feasibility study done? You know, what are some of the basic touch points? Where would they go? And then how would they try to make that trade-off between maybe a mobile unit, which the uh, person asking the question says they're thinking about, versus a more stationary facility? Where do they start? Well, let's, let's start and go backwards. First off, well, let's start and go forwards, actually. First off, if they're in the Northeast, they can call us and hire us, and we'll do a feasibility. Um, but uh, now let's go backwards. 
if you're thinking about a mobile unit, then you need a USDA processor. Okay, if you don't have a USDA processor nearby uh, where you can haul these carcasses to, or as I alluded to, uh, places with licenses that can break these uh, carcasses down further, you're, you should not be looking at a mobile slaughter unit or a mobile processing unit. As far as a feasibility study, really what you're looking at is how many animals are within the area, and then and and when I say area, you know we look at 100 miles, but some places out west might be looking at 200, 300, or even even more miles than that. And then you're also looking at what's your competition? How many other slaughterhouses are within the area? And do you really need a slaughterhouse? Uh, is it really just a seasonality issue and a, a production issue? Um, as far as the overall components of it, you know, of a feasibility study, it's, it's also the question of will those farmers that are going to supply those animals increase the sizes of their herds once those, that capacity has increased. And we've heard from many farmers here in the Northeast and in New York that they will increase the sizes of their herds and grow more animals if, there are more, if there's more capacity. But every feasibility study is based upon the individual nuances uh, of that geographic area. And until you get in and start doing the research, and it, certainly I could go into more detail and, you know, I could, I could provide an outline of what a feasibility study entails because we've done them. But, you know, those basic general concepts that I touched on, I hope I answered that question. But again, you know, I never think that you can answer a question correct quickly. Right. Uh, there, there's just too much information. Some of your responses in, in the presentation uh, relates to a question that Tom asks around um, state inspection systems versus USDA. So maybe tell folks a little bit about that whole scenario and what it means if a state does have it, if it doesn't have it. Uh, I will. I won't do this very good justice because New York State does not really have a state inspection uh, system. As I understand it, a state inspection system has to be as good, if not better than a USDA inspection system. Um, state inspection does not allow you to go beyond state borders, um, and I, it's my understanding it's, it's just as rigorous to an extent as USDA. Arian Thibimri of, of MPAN at Lawrence Meads has a lot more knowledge of this on a, on a national level. In New York State, what we have is custom exempt plants where everything is stamped not for sale. We did have state inspectors, this is not really a state inspection system, but we did have state inspectors that would inspect those plants every, once every year or two, but the state asked the USDA for more money to do that, and the USDA said no, so the state told the USDA that they would have to do those annual inspections, and we are getting phone calls from custom exempt plants that are being shut down by the USDA because they don't have an SSOP. They don't have a Sanitation Standard Operating Procedures Plan. You do not need a full HACCP, but you do need an SSOP for a custom exempt plant, and if you don't have one or if you're too dirty or if you're not following it, they will shut you down. Okay, good. That's pretty clear. Nicole, uh, did you have a question? Okay. I can't hear her. Oh, are you muted? She may be muted. Here we go. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. A local butcher who wanted to slaughter only a few cattle a day withdrew from opening his business due to excessive lab tests requirements in Pennsylvania. Is there any way to overcome government overkill designed for big slaughterhouse but are killing small processors? What would you say to that? I would say that you should be able to answer that question because you deal with HACCP more than I do in the lab <laughs> testing. Um, I, I would say that um, I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, I, I would question how much testing he's doing and what his requirements are. Um, I think, you know, a, a phone call to an animal science uh, university or somebody like Chris Rains could answer some of those questions. Uh, the reality is, is whether you're doing two, three, thirty, fifty a week, you are butchering animals that are in a system of review. Uh, it's going into the public food system. Those are the rules of the game, unfortunately, for some folks. And you have to 
play by the rules of the game. Um, I, I think that you would, you could call us and we could look at your individual situation a little bit more and maybe give you some guidance. I don't know if I can really fully answer that. Obviously, one of the things that I would point out is that, you know, Kate is, we don't have a huge endowment. We're dependent upon funding and, and funders. And so we welcome any questions or work that's out there, but it really depends upon the resources that are available that can pay for us or consultants to look at your operation and your problem. But feel free to call us. Feel free to email us, and we will try to help. And as, what, as Jeff stated earlier or at the beginning of the webinar, we will be holding a, a second webinar um, to answer these questions in which I will have more participation. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I, I am going to jump in uh, um, and talk about this discussion webinar. Chris, Nicole, thank you so much. Uh, that's a ton of information. Um, and uh, come, come back in two weeks. Uh, Chris and Nicole will be with us again, March 3rd at 3.30, same Thursday at 3.30, um, for the discussion portion of this webinar. You got a taste uh, with the Q&A section here, uh, but we really want to open this up, um, and they'll be able to address many of the questions uh, that have been sent in. There have been a ton of wonderful questions that we are sorry that we can't get to today, but we have this opportunity uh, in in two weeks. This is a new format we're trying, uh, this super dense information packed presentation and then a good long discussion style webinar. There is a post webinar survey that will open in your browser at the very end of the webinar. You can sign up for the discussion webinar with a single click right there. We're also interested in how you feel about our decision to add the discussion webinar. Remember that we are recording this webinar and it will be posted to watch within a few few business days. So you should feel free to review the webinar and email us at contact at mgfn.org with any questions that you'd like addressed on the discussion webinar. Of course, you'll be able to ask questions on the discussion webinar as well. Uh, but if you want to get your question in, uh, and you, you, know, you should feel free to direct any colleagues to watch the recording and then join us on the discussion webinar. There's no requirement that you have to have attended this webinar to attend the discussion webinar. In general, NGFN webinars are the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We focus on bringing you the best models and ideas around scaling up good food. Again, we do record and archive all our webinars, and this one will be available on our site within a few business days. If you'd like to review the webinar, share it with a colleague. The URL is right there ngfn.org slash webinars. And we've recently made it easier to find the webinar recording archives that you might be interested in. We've grouped the webinars into topics such as aggregation and distribution, farm to school, food safety, policy, value chains, and more. Of course, many of web webinars cover several of these topics and they are appropriately cross-listed. We hope this will help you find the webinar archives that will be most helpful in your work. As I mentioned in the opening, the Wallace Center NGFN has become a cooperative agreement with the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service to understand and support food hubs or local regional aggregation facilities. Our working definition for a food hub is a centrally located facility with a business management structure facilitating the aggregation, storage, processing, distribution, and or marketing of locally regional regionally produced foods. As a first step, Wallace and a team of other organizations, including the Project for Public Spaces and the National Association for Produce Market Managers, is trying to identify all the food hubs in existence or just getting started across the nation. If you are part of a food hub, let us know. There's a URL up there, bit.ly slash myfoodhub, where there are a short series of questions so we know who you are. If you know someone else involved in a food hub, please let them know about this questionnaire as well. There's also a link to this survey at the, on the front page on the ngfn.org website. The Wallace Center and NGFN plays its role as Convener Next in Detroit. We're part of a team sponsoring a participant-driven, action-oriented conference. Conference participants will form into two teams, uh, sorry, into teams around 10 to 12 real-world projects or businesses, and around three to five general distribution issue areas, which will be selected in advance through an application process. Participants will work together for the duration of the conference in these teams to help build actual businesses solving existing business challenges, develop research projects, and identify best practices to help tackle the challenge of local and regional food distribution, logistics, infrastructure, and transportation. 
for more background on teams, visit makinggoodfoodwork.com. This is really an innovative and exciting conference. You may never have attended anything like it before. We want to let you know about two other upcoming opportunities centered around local regional meat. NGFN Partner Network, the National Farm to School Network, is offering a webinar on meat in a couple of weeks, March 8 at 1 p.m. Eastern. They will present success stories on getting local meat into, the, into food cafeterias. They'll also include a section on brainstorming ways to uh, leap hurdles you may have faced in this work. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention the first annual North Carolina Meat Conference toward the end of March, getting together different actors in the value chain. They hope to build regional opportunities in sustainable and artisanal meat. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. Um, I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interest, your bio, and other information to our growing database of people, organization, and funders, increasing your ability to connect to people within your regions and nationally. This is a resource to find people doing similar or complementary work. This is all part of the NGFN Acting as Connector. Look for the database link in the resources section of our website. If you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or you can let us know uh, in the post-webinar survey and uh, we'll sign you up. Please contact us any time. Email address is contact at ngfn.org. And the NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out that survey. It'll open in your web browser in just a moment. And let us know if you want to be automatically signed up for the discussion webinar. This concludes this webinar. We will see you in a couple of weeks.